Welcome to the Latin American Perspectives Podcast. My name is Alexander Scott, and I am broadcasting to you today from Fullerton, California. For today's episode, I had the pleasure of talking with LAP contributing author and collective member Emilio Betances about his article titled The Rise and Fall of Marcha Verde in the Dominican Republic that was published recently in the new September issue of LAP. Emilio Betances is a professor of sociology and Latin American studies at Gettysburg College and a renowned scholar on the politics, history, and culture of the Dominican Republic. As a scholar, he uses the Dominican Republic as a case study to reflect on issues of social development, state formation, religion, politics, social movements, citizenship, and democracy. Among his many publications include the book State and Society in the Dominican Republic, published in 1995 by Westview Press, the book The Catholic Church and Power Politics in Latin America, The Dominican Case and Comparative Perspective, published in 2007 by Roman and Littlefield, and the book En Busca de la Ciudadanía, Los Movimientos Sociales y la Democratización en la República Dominicana published in 2016 as part of the Dominican Republic's Archive General de la Nación. Now, before I play the interview of our discussion, I want to stress to all you listeners that if you have any interest in social movements, Latin American politics, current or future issues in Latin America, you really need to go check out the current and previous LAP issues on social movements in Latin America. Like every issue of LAP, these are full of great scholarship on the current and historic issues and social movements in Latin America, but more importantly, I think the articles contained in these two past issues provide important insights and information that can inform our understandings of the current political crises of right-wing populism and authoritarianism that we are seeing throughout Latin America and much of the world. Additionally, I think reading these issues can inform our strategies on the left for how we can confront these crises. I think most of you would agree that now more than ever, it is important that we as students, teachers, scholars, and organizers engage in praxis and apply our countless hours of study and scholarship to benefit our political projects and movements. Okay. Now that I've stepped off my soapbox, let's get on to my interview with Emilio. So first, I want to thank you for uh, making the time to meet with me. I'm really looking forward to learning about your paper and this topic. Yes. Well, first, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this podcast, which many people interested in social movement might listen to it. First question I want to ask is, what was the Marcha Verde and what was the specific inspiration or motivation for this movement? Well, regarding your question about what started the Marcha Verde, uh, basically it was a relationship that the Dominican government had with a Brazilian company called Odebrecht. Odebrecht had been giving, had been invited to the Dominican Republic to build a thermoelectric plant in the southern part of the island. Uh, And then on December 22nd, 1916, uh, we came up on the news that Odebrecht had declared in in New York, to a New York court, in New York, uh, that it had bribed countries in 12 countries in the world, and 10 of them were in Latin America. And the bribes that were given were 700, uh, over $700 million. The countries in Latin America included Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and of course the Dominican Republic, and there were two other countries that are located in Africa. So uh, the company entered into a plea agreement with the New York court because, you know, Odebrecht 
is a Brazilian transnational corporation that dedicated to construction, uh, registered in Wall Street, and US laws require it to disclose these issues. So when the, this issue arrived in the Dominican Republic, it, you know, TV commentators in Z101, which is a radio station in Santo Domingo, which has a, 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 a national scope in coverage, they were discussing the issue and they immediately called on social movement leaders in the Dominican Republic that had been engaged in a previous movement in the Dominican Republic, a movement called the 4% for Education. And these leaders were asked to come over to the program and they decided right on the radio station to call for a demonstration, a march against what was happening. And this march was going to be, you know, in, 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 in what was it called? The date, January 22nd, you know. And uh, they were uh, appalled that Odebrecht had paid 92 millions in the Dominican Republic, and that apparently this company had been involved in the campaign of President Medina, uh, President Danilo Medina, which had been elected a year earlier in the Dominican Republic. And it happens that one of the operatives of Odebrecht, you know, uh, uh, Joao Santana, he had his office in the presidential palace right next door to the president's and he had been the campaign director for President Medina. So in Brazil, they asked Marcelo, I mean, uh, Joao Santana to return to Brazil and uh, because he was facing charges over there. So this uh, issue of the New York court caused really an uproar in the Dominican Republic because it had to do with the issues of impunities and corruption, which, you know, the government of Danilo Medina, but also previous uh, president of the governing party, the Dominican Liberation Party, the PLD, had also been involved with all the Brazilian companies and all the corruption scandals. So people were, I would say, sensitive to these kinds of issues. So this is the spark that got the flames going, you know, regarding the Marcha Verde. So you've already, you've already started to, I think, touch on this, but I'm curious, could you provide for our listeners some more background information on the historical and political economic uh, context that preceded and produced the uh, Marcha, Marcha Verde? Like, what, what has been the DR's experience with neoliberal restructuring since the 1980s, and has that played a role in this? Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, you know, I have written a book on Dominican social movements, which was published by the National Archives in the Dominican Republic. It's called In Search of Citizenship. And this search of citizenship Later, I would like to say something about theory, how I got to this uh, topic of the, the idea of construction of citizenship in the Dominican Republic through social movements, at least one area. Now, in the Dominican Republic, you know, I would say that social movements and uh, that struggle against the IMF and the neoliberal uh, economic policies go back to the early 1980s. In fact, in, in April 1984, we had a big blowout in the country. It's a, an uprising that lasted for, for three days and uh, had national coverage. And this was an uprising against the government signing an agreement whereby the IMF was going to implement its traditional structural adjustment programs. And this blowout, you know, this uprising that took place in April 1984, you know, initiated 
I would say, a new type of social movements in the Dominican Republic. Uh, now, movements which are not necessarily controlled by the traditional left, uh, which are not controlled by labor unions, but rather an uprising that occurs in the poorest sectors of the cities, because it's not something that just occurred in Santo Domingo, but it was a nationwide type of blowout. So this uprising, you know, of 1984, you know, was a signal of the opposition that to IMF style structural adjustment programs in the Dominican Republic. So this continued through the 80s and the early 90s, you know, this, there were several strikes that paralyzed the nation, you know, in their late 80s and particularly in the early 90s. And then came an outside event, which is the Gulf War, uh, when the United States uh, invaded Iraq, that, that created oil shortages in the Dominican Republic, and it kind of stopped the momentum of these kinds of movements that were happening in the country. So we had this significant experience, you know. Also in the labor movement through the 1980s, they engaged in dialogue with the government, with the mediation of the Catholic Church. And that also gave an experience to social movements in the Dominican Republic. But the other side of the movement was uh, grassroots type of movements, you know, that were developing nationwide. But then after the, the Iraq war, you know, this movement tended to uh, decline significantly. And, and they will not come back really until the beginning of the, the, the end of the first decade of the 21st century. But what is interesting is that the new movements that are emerging in 2008, 2009 are mostly environmental types, you know, against the establishing of a cement plant, you know, close to the city of Santo Domingo in one of the national parks uh, Parque Nacional Los Aitises in the Dominican Republic. And that uh, this began with this environmental movement, but now it was mostly middle class based. Whereas the early movement of 1980 uh, were labor and also grassroots movements that occurred mostly in, in, in poor neighborhoods. But this new movement, the environmental movements against the cement plant initiated a new type of movement, which is mostly middle-class based. This was kind of the precedent for the uh, struggles of the 4% for, edu for primary uh, pre-university education in the Dominican Republic. Uh, this was a demand which asked the government to abide by the law of 1997, which require the government to spend 4% of the national budget uh, for education. So, so this, this was quite significant, you know, and uh, it gathered momentum among middle-class types of association, NGO, you know, churches, the Catholic Church was behind it, even the National Business Association was behind supporting this kind of, of movement. So the 4% for education became a, a, a middle-class movement that responded not only to the needs of people in, in uh, poor neighborhoods, but also to many in the middle classes that were, not able, were no longer able to pay for tuition increases. So as a result of this movement, which you know, uh, had a number of demonstrations, not only in the city of Santo Domingo, but in Santiago, San Francisco de Macorís, and various other parts of the country. You know, it also took advantage of the visibility that it got on the press, the new types of means of communication, you know, you know Facebook, uh, Twitter, all these kinds of new media uh, helped uh, you know, develop this movement. And uh, also uh, there was the idea that the, the, the Inter-American Bank and the World Bank had been suggesting to the Dominican Republic to increase its, uh, its investment in education, 
we are talking about that between, say, 1997 and 2012, the Dominican Republic was spending a little less than 2% of the gross domestic product in education. I'm sorry, I mentioned the national budget before, but I mean to say the gross domestic product, 4% of the gross domestic product, the government was only spending less than 2% for all those years. So this movement took advantage of those international recommendations, but also it took advantage of a nationwide kind of agreement, you know, on the need for buttressing the education budget. So this is how the President Danilo Medina saw that as an opportunity and signed in on an agreement that if he was elected, he was going to spend 4% of the GDP in education. And that was uh, something quite significant when he actually won and upon winning, he appointed a Secretary of, of Education uh, or Minister of Education in the Dominican Republic. And, uh, and they began to implement uh, the 4% for education. Uh, so this experience of the 4% for education, the participation of NGO, of all kinds of institutions, you know, private and public, uh, is, I would say, the immediate background for the experience that was necessary to move ahead uh, the Marcha Verde. Thank you for that context. I want to continue talking about the Marcha Verde, but before we before we go further, I, I I read your paper and I'm really interested in the theoretical framework that you applied to studying this movement and understanding this movement. Um, as a social movement scholar, I have a lot of thoughts about different theoretical frameworks for how sociologists approach social movements. So. How does your approach differ from some of these established theoretical approaches to social movements? And, and why are these differences important? Okay, generally, for example, the social movement literature published in Latin American perspectives and in various journals in Latin America tend to emphasize that social movements are resistance type of movements that they resist the implementation of IMF policy across the region. Uh, as part of that, we have the indigenous movements in Ecuador, in Bolivia. You know, we have the MST, the landless movement in Brazil. We also have the piqueteros in Argentina, you know, and that these various movements are, tend to be presented as, um, as resistance movement. Uh, my take on this is that I thought that this movement could be seen as movement that seek to develop citizenship rights uh, through their claims. And when I mean citizenship rights, I'm talking about civil rights, political rights, social rights, following in the lines of uh, Marshall, the English sociologist, you know. Now, but now, you know, we see also people making claims about sexual orientation, claims about women's rights, claims about indigenous rights, and so on and so forth. You know, so I am seeing social movements then in the light of movements that seek to uh, establish the basis for citizenship. A, a program that, of course, or a demand that takes a long time to develop, particularly in countries like those of Latin America. Then the other additional issue that I present in the article is that as this movement are trying to build citizenship, not only in the area of civil, political, and social rights, but in various other rights, as I mentioned earlier, as they are doing that, they are also making a claim for what uh, Joao or uh, what the Sosa Santo, Boaventura de Sosa Santo calls democratizing democracy. So by pushing forward these demands, requesting or asking, demanding, you know, uh, demanding uh, the end of impunity, 
the end of corruption. And these movements are asking, in essence, to democratize democracy, to make it possible to have a more participative type of democracy, you know, through referendums, through ensuring that the rule of law is implemented. So these movements are, these new movements are, like I said, in the case of the Dominican Republic, mostly middle class uh, types of movement, which are interested in creating uh, liberal democratic institutions. Uh, they are not interested, or they don't appear to be, to be interested in waging a struggle to construct a different type of society, but rather to ensure that the rule of law is implemented. And when I look at the case of Marcha Verdes uh, in the Dominican Republic, I see it in the larger context of Latin America. The more recent, for example, has been the struggle in Chile that began in October 2018, you know, where they were demanding a reform of the constitution. Now in October this year, there are plans for a referendum in Chile. You know, uh, you know that I see uh, the, the case of Chile as a good example of a struggle of democratized society. Similarly, we see the victory of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in Mexico, also in 2018, which is part of this process of trying to democratize societies which have been pretty conservative and also uh, only responding to what the neoliberal project uh, demands. So what we, what I, the, 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 I see these movements as seeking to democratize uh, societies in these countries of Latin America. In the case of Marcha Verde, you know, is asking essentially for the end of impunity, the end of corruption, and for example, it use the case of the, what should I call it, use the case of, uh, of the Odebrecht, you know, contracts, you know, how Odebrecht and Mar uh, and Joao Santana, one of the operatives of that company, you know, was the one in charge of organizing the elections, you know, directing the campaign for Danilo Medina, you know, in, 2000, in 2016. And in order to win those elections, he went ahead and, you know, pay a congressman in order to vote for him in, in the, to change the constitution. And the money, you know, that was used for this came from other break. And uh, so far, you know, uh, during the government of Medina, it was never clear up, you know, who received the money. Only one person has been named as having received the money, but then how was the constitution changed? You know, who got, who received money among congressmen? Only one of the, ma or two of the major uh, politicians uh, and one of them, two of them members of the, the ministerial staff of the government, uh, you know, who, re, who accepted that they received money. Uh, one of them was the Victor Clemontas, which at the time was the Minister of the Economy, and he accepted that he received money from other brace and that that money was for the political party. There was also the Minister of, uh, of, of Public Works and Communication, uh, who also accepted that, he, that the money came in and that the money was used for, for the party, not for himself. Now, neither of these two persons were brought to trial during the time of, of, uh, of, uh, of the presidency of, of Danilo Medina. So what you have with Odebrecht is, you know, with Marcha Verde is a movement that sought to ensure that the rule of law was implemented within the framework of liberal democracy. I find that, uh, that framework really useful for a lot of reasons. Um, but I, I think most importantly, it just adds a lot more nuance to our understanding of social movements in Latin America. As you said, there's, I think, a, a tendency at times to just frame all these movements as just resistance movements against neoliberalism or capitalism. But clearly, they're using a more liberal sort of restorative justice sort of framework. So that's, that's really uh, fascinating to me. 
Now, now that we're back on the topic of the Marcha Verde, I'm curious to know, like, what were the outcomes of the Marcha Verde? And uh, did, the, did the movement break down? And if so, uh, could you talk about that process? Well, there are several things here. Let me go one by one. Uh, first, address the rise of the Marcha Verde in the first uh, six months of 2017. Then to look at why, you know, it uh, divided, the leadership divided, or split up. And finally, what were the accomplishments? So these three uh, points. So after the march of January 22nd that I mentioned earlier, you know, Marcha Verde between January and July organized 26 marches in the country. And these marches, you know, were not just in the capital city, they occurred in the different provinces of the country. And uh, whenever uh, the marches were concluded, they would read a manifesto. And in this manifesto, of course, the, the main issues were uh, end of impunity and corruption, but at the local level, people also raised their own demands, you know, dealing with, you know, road constructions, uh, bridge constructions, school constructions, uh, you know, corruption at the local level, and so on and so forth. But, you know, 26 marches, and then this uh, rising tide of marches ended you know, in July, uh, July 16, 2017, with a huge march in the city of Santo Domingo, which doubled the number of people that went to the first march. The first march, you know, had an estimate of around 60,000 people. Just to put it into perspective, when the movement for 4% had the largest march, it only gathered around 10,000 people. The Marcha Verde in the first march that was in January 22nd gathered around 120,000 people. So, you know, it, it, uh, it was quite significant, you know. So the, uh, the accomplishment at that time, I would say, was revealing the corrupt nature of the Dominican government. And, uh, and that led some people to think that not only they had the upper hand, but that they could even remove the government from power. And this is the issue that began to divide the Marcha Verde into what I call radicals and moderates. The moderate thought that they needed to work within the system. These are the people that come from the 4% for education types, education movement. The other ones, you know, the more radical, come from the fragments that are left of the traditional Dominican left. And, and they are people that have experience in organizing assembly. You know, the Marcha Verde, they had, every Tuesday they had a, a assemblies, at the, you know, in the first, first six months at the national, at the, at the Universidad Autónoma de Santo Domingo, the National Autonomous University of Santo Domingo, and uh, also in the provinces. So these uh, people who were well trained in, uh, in manipulating assemblies, you know, uh, would take long in, in, in making their speeches, and that began to cause frustration among those people who were against corruption and impunity but we're not interested in going really beyond that, you know. So it, that began to create some tensions. You know, the radicals thought that, you know, with all this rising tide of marches, it was possible to overthrow the government. So there was a, a group of intellectuals that called, you know, for the resignation of the president. And, uh, and that began to create a, significant problems, you know, within the Marcha Verde group. So after that March of July 16 in 2017, you know, 
there were no significant events that the Marcha Verde organized in terms of marches. You know, what they did was to organize, you know, uh, uh, forums to, you know, uh, to try to discuss issues concerning, you know, corruption and how corruption affects the lives of people. But nonetheless, despite this apparent division at the time, you know, you could, uh, the, the sympathy for Marcha Verdes was quite significant to the point that in August 12, the following year, in 2018, Marcha Verdes organized perhaps the largest march that has been organized in Dominican history outside a political campaign. You know, the, the, the estimate varies significantly between 150,000, 200, and some people will say even 250,000, the amount of people that went to this march. I am not always so accepting of the organizers' predictions about how many people they have, but at least 150,000 people at, 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 attended this march. It was quite significant. But that was the last march that was organized. Uh, there was another uh, issue that came up. It is that, you know, 1918, 1919, 2018, 2019 were years already the, for preparation for the following campaign. We were supposed to have elections in 2020. So the political parties of the opposition, which had supported the Marcha Verdes, now changed their, their political activities, you know, in preparation for the forthcoming elections, you know, of 2020. Nonetheless, Marcha Verdes raised consciousness about corruption and impunity. Marcha Verde also revealed that the Dominican government was corrupt to its root, and particularly the official party, the Dominican Liberation Party, was very corrupt, was very involved in the whole Odebrecht scandal, you see, and I think that perhaps this was the most uh, significant uh, accomplishment of Marcha Verde, even if it couldn't continue, but at least it raised consciousness about, you know, uh, corruption. And to the point, you know, that, uh, that the government of Danilo Medina, that wanted again to change the constitution in 2020 uh, for the 2020 election so he could run in the election, he wasn't able to do it. Uh, polls indicated that the, most of the population was opposed to the change of the constitution so Danilo Medina could run again. So you see, I would say in, in short that the, the consciousness created by Marcha Verde among the population was an important element in the development, in the construction of social citizenship. That is the point that I'm trying to raise. And I also that it, it not only raised the consciousness about citizenship, but it also unveiled the corrupt nature of the Dominican government, the lack of a due process, and how the president and his entourage are above good and evil, and how the society was militating against that. The defeat of, of, uh, of Danilo Medina, who was unable to to, uh, to change the constitution, I think had much to do with demonstration of Marcha Verde. Great. What I wanted to say about, just to end, about the influence of Marcha Verde, during the first stage of Marcha Verde, the youth was not involved. And that was something that was quite evident. One of the youngest persons involved was about 35 years old in terms of the national leadership of Marcha Verde. The other people were 50 and 60 years old, right? That's a quite significant thing. Now, what happened is that uh, before the elections of 2000, uh, uh, the elections, the national elections, we had, you know, in 2000, uh, let me see, we had uh, municipal elections. In this, uh, uh, in leading up to the municipal elections, 
in the Dominican Republic, you know, at the, which were going to occur, you know, uh, less than two months before the national elections, you see? Uh, so the government uh, made a huge mistake in the municipal elections. And the mistake that the government and the Central Electoral Commission play was that uh, in the areas where the opposition had the possibility of winning, they did not put the names and pictures of the opposition party's candidate. And that became a, a, a big uproar. And so many protests emerged. So this is where the youth began to go out and demonstrate. And then there was the demonstration of something called Plaza de la Bandera. There is a big plaza in Santo Domingo with huge, with, with the Dominican flag. And uh, so, and it is far away from the center of the city, relatively far, like maybe 10 kilometers, 14 kilometers from the center of the city. And they, well, maybe 10 kilometers, 14, maybe too much, 10 kilometers. So the youth gathered there and uh, they exerted considerable pressure. And so the elections have to be held again. And the government lost those elections. So I think it was quite significant that after Marcha Verde, the youth came, and again with similar claims, claims dealing with the issue of, of, of political rights, you know, with the issue of corruption, with denunciation of, of an elections that were, you know, uh, fraudulent, that the government tried to steal the elections. So that was quite significant. Then after that, you know, in the fall, the following fall, you know, the government party had internal elections and the government party divided because one of the main candidates, Leonel Fernandez, who was a president in the Dominican Republic in, three, in, in 1997 to 2000 and then 2004 to 2012, a very renowned uh, figure in Dominican politics, but just as corrupt as Danilo Medina, you see? The thing is that he, uh, uh, Danilo Medina, when he wasn't able to, uh, to get re uh, change the constitution in 2019, right? Uh, then he proposed a candidate, the most unpalatable candidate, who was Minister of, of, of Public Works and Communication, and who had been involved in various corruption scandals, you know. And now, even now, there are these issues are still reverberating in the Dominican Republic. So what happened is that with this candidate, his name is uh, Gonzalo Castillo, you know, Gonzalo Castillo was a person that was not palatable had not uh, much political experience and was unable to compete against Lionel Fernandez. But, you know, with the resources that the government has, you know, at its, you know, disposal, they were, uh, uh, Danilo Medina was, was able to ensure that his candidate would win the elections. As a result, uh, Lionel Fernandez felt betrayed and left the party. So the official party divided. And so uh, we have that Lionel Fernandez had to create a, a new political party, which is, uh, you know, uh, and then this new political party, you know, is very hard to compete from the opposition against the government. So the other candidate from the opposition, uh, who is now the current president of the Dominican Republic, uh, Luis Abinader, he was a member of the Dominican uh, uh, Partido Revolucionario Moderno, the modern Dominican Revolutionary Party. That party is, uh, came out of a traditional party in the Dominican Republic called Dominican Revolutionary Party. That party divided and the revolution, uh, Mo, Partido Revolucionario Moderno or PRM, uh, you know, uh, came out and was actually founded in 2014, you know, and Abinader began to develop his, his political party. Now, this political party 
had supported Marcha Verde as many other parties of the opposition. And he himself uh, attended, you know, I recall seeing him in the March of July 16, 2017, at marching with everybody else. And uh, so this candidate, to make a long story short, Luis Abinader is the one who wins the elections and he takes advantage of the fact that the government party split into the president's candidate, Gonzalo Castillo, and the, the other candidate of the PRD, uh, uh, the PLD, Leonel Fernandez. So the division in the government opened a wedge that, through which could, uh, Luis Abinader could drive in. Now, Luis Abinader was elected president. He is now, he was sworn in in August 16, this past August. And, uh, and you know, uh, it's very early to evaluate his government, but some of the appointments that he made might be uh, significant. For example, the new attorney general is a woman that suffer the consequences of the corruption and irregularity of the Danilo Medina's government. Uh, she was a member of the Supreme Court and now she is the Attorney General, a very important position in the Dominican Republic. Another important development is that one of the key leaders of Marcha Verde, uh, Carlos, Carlos, oh, I can't remember his last name, uh, is now the in charge of contract and acquisitions, the state contract and acquisition agency. It's the person that oversee all the stuff that the government buys. Carlos Pimentel is his name. Carlos Pimentel come from an NGO which has been involved in the fight for democracy, you know, anti-corruption, impunity, you know, it's called the uh, Participación Ciudadana or citizenship participation. It's an open middle class type organization that receives financing from the United States and various other European governments, you know. And so this organization, you know, uh, Carlos Pimentel is known from coming from that organization, from being linked to Marcha Verde. So that is an interesting development. Now, we must remember that Luis Abinader is a neoliberal president. He appointed to the central bank, you know, this being that has been in that office for over 20 years. And uh, he was with Balaguer and then with Lionel Fernandez, with Danilo Medina, and he's characterized for his neoliberal, you know, uh, leading. Also the Ministry of the Presidency, uh, Mark Arrulla, is also another businessman, uh, obviously a neoliberal. So, Except for the Ministry of the Economy, where he appointed a kind of Keynesian type of economist, you know, the main key players in the, in the government are neoliberal candidates. We should not be lose sight of this, that this is a neoliberal type of government. But it has begun uh, to implement some of the demands that Marcia Verde had been raising. And because of this, it, it, it still enjoys certain popularity, you know. Now, with the coronavirus uh, infection, now, you know, all social movements, not only in the Dominican Republic, but even in Chile that had the largest movement has been severely curtailed. You know, demonstration continue in Chile and they have been uh, repressed uh, in the last uh, few days, you know, but it doesn't have the force that it used to have. So the same thing happens in the Dominican Republic that uh, this new ingredient, the, uh, the coronavirus has kind of stopped, you know, political activities, uh, holding demonstrations and, and things like that. Well, with the whole coronavirus thing in mind, I know it's impossible to offer concrete predictions about the future but do you anticipate anything coming of the coronavirus of how this might continue to affect movements in the future or how movements are responding to the crisis? Or has it just been a decimating effect on social movements? Or well, my reflection on this issue of the coronavirus and the possibility of social movements 
in the near future is that the situation in Latin America has worsened as a result of the virus. I agree. The level of poverty has increased region-wide, you know. And uh, this is a situation which is, will produce more social movements. People will uh, find, you know, the need to protest against, you know, the type of policies that continue to be implemented in Latin America. For example, the only government in Latin America that has, you know, looked at a renegotiation of the foreign debt is Argentina. You know, Argentina had 93% of the, of the gross domestic product was paid in foreign, to the, went to pay the foreign debt. Now, through the negotiation of the Alberto Fernandez government, Argentina reduced the foreign debt to 53%. So that's the only government in the region that has addressed this issue because it shows that that problem is still there. If you look at the case of Mexico, where you have a progressive government in power, but it doesn't want to talk about renegotiation of the debt. You know, uh, Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico, mentioned that he supported Alberto Fernandez. And uh, the other day, he even mentioned that, you know, it will be hard for Mexico or any other country to resolve the new crisis or the deepening of a crisis that already existed because of coronavirus that, but he, didn't, he hasn't gone ahead and say, oh, we need to look at renegotiating a debt which was, you know, contracted by authorities which, you know, were, uh, very corrupt, you know, and in this right. you know, corruption scheme was involved the IMF, the U.S. Treasury, you know, and the rest of it, you know. So the conditions in Latin America are such that necessarily, you know, when the conditions permitted, that this will be happening. But you see, if you read the news about Colombia over the last few days, there have been huge demonstrations in Colombia against police brutality. And the government had to go out and apologize, you know, to the population. Uh, and various of the people have died uh, in, in the confrontation with the police in Colombia. So while it's true that the coronavirus stops social movements, the people do not stop protesting because of the injustices that they are undergoing. So, my take is that given the situation in the region of social injustice, you know, the inequality, the social inequality that exists, you know, that regardless of that, of the coronavirus, people will continue to go out. Remember that in Latin America, nearly 60% of the people live in the informal economy. And most of the people do not have access to healthcare. In Mexico, for example, 69 million people do not have access to health care. Now the government of Lopez Obrador is doing all it can to create better conditions, but he cannot, you know, uh, create favorable conditions overnight. It will take some time, you know, but they are working hard, I understand, in Mexico, uh, dealing with the coronavirus and so on and so forth. But generally, when you look outside Mexico, no country, you know, is doing much in this area. Luis Abinader in the Dominican Republic has proposed, I must admit, that to incorporate two million people who do not have any health care to uh, uh, register in a government agency in order to have, you know, access to health care. I must admit, that he has already, you know, a, a put out a, a, a significant amount of money, around 60 million Dominican pesos, to address the issue of, of, of healthcare. Because the system of healthcare in the Dominican Republic is in, in dire straits. It's a, in a very poor situation, you know. To the point, you know, just to give you an idea, that the Dominican Republic is one of the countries that spend less 
in healthcare than any other country in Latin America, you know. So we're talking about around two something percent that the government spent on healthcare when the needs are of 7% of the gross domestic product that will be needed in order to address this kind of, now, we don't know if Luis Abinader will be able or will be willing to, to improve healthcare and education. He has made a lot of promises. We have to see schools will not open until November 2nd, and he has promised that he's going to have laptops for all the kids in public school. But he has, he's not able to address one key issue. And it is that in order for you to have laptops and computers working, you need electricity. And connectivity is very poor in the Dominican Republic. So, but that is an issue on which they are working. And I hope that they will make more progress than what the previous administration had made. So I'm very hopeful. And as much as I'm hopeful about the case of Mexico, where the administration of Lopez Obrador is doing a pretty good job in dealing with the pandemic, pa, pa, uh, the, the virus, you know, the infections, and also uh, propping up the hospitals and uh, and having beds and ventilators for the people, you know. So they have do, done a good job on that, I, I must admit. Well, I, I really, I gotta say, I really appreciate your optimistic outlook. Um, it's a lot more optimistic and positive than a lot of other folks I've talked to, so that's, that's really great to hear and reassuring. Well, um, you know, we have no choice but to be optimistic. Right, right. That's, all, that's all we got. Um, Say hello to everybody there, to, to Ron and company. I will. Awesome. Well, nice to meet you, Emilio, and you have a great day, okay? You too. Take care. Ciao, ciao. Well, that is all the time we have for today, but I hope you enjoyed listening into our show. Thank you for listening in, and please don't forget to add us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And please, consider sharing this podcast with your like-minded friends and compañeros. We'll be back soon with another episode of the Latin American Perspectives podcast.